Welcome everyone to another performance clinic, monitoring as code, empowering developers through shift left observability. My name is Andy Grabner, and with me today, I'm really honored to have uh, Christoph Renders with me. Hi, Christoph, how are you doing? Hey, Andy, good afternoon. I'm good, how are you still? Not too bad. Just as you mentioned earlier, before we started the recording, it seems uh, a shave uh, is definitely uh, you know, necessary <laughs> at some point uh, once they start selling uh, razor blades again. Um, well, as soon as you start talking to a volleyball, uh, I'll get worried, but so far. So good. <laughs> okay. So thanks everybody for, for, for being here. Uh, this is part of my performance clinic series. Uh, if you watch this live, use the Q&A feature to ask questions. If you watch the recording, either on YouTube or Dynatrace University, you know, leave a comment or you can also see our two uh, uh, Twitter handles here. And as you also have our names and you both know we work at Dynatrace, I'm pretty sure it's easy to guess our emails because it's firstname.lastname at dynatrace.com. Uh, having that said, Christoph, I, this is a truly exciting topic. And I know you will give us a little uh, background about where this all came from, uh, what is this whole idea of monitoring as code, and you have a lot of exciting demos prepared. So therefore- Yes, definitely. I want to hand it over to you. I will keep quiet as much as I can, but if I have a question or if I see questions coming in, I may interrupt you. Other than that, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. So good uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and, and the topic for today, as Andy said, is, is monitoring as code and how we can help organizations to really uh, leverage observability earlier in the life cycle and apply configuration in an automated fashion. And the reason for that is very simple, right? Observability at scale is, is very easy if you have a platform that was built for it. And I think most of you who are, who are you know, proud users of our Dynaxis platform know that, right? So just to put this in, in, as an example, this is, this is a particular customer that we, are, we were working with and six hours into the first deployment, keeping in mind that you know, it takes time to set up the platform, provision servers and things like that. But six hours in, we had about 51, one agents deployed across the estate. Now, looking and fast forwarding into 24 hours, you see that we have 18,000 monitored hosts. That's a massive amount of, of, of monitoring that was just enabled in an automated way. And the reason for that is that, that the core technology of our Dynatrace platform, the one agent, was built for web scale. It's super easy to deploy. It detects automatically dependencies, it automatically instruments processes that are seen on a host, right? It actually does all of that in an easy and automatable way. We have support for Kubernetes through an operator and OpenShift. We have support for uh, automation platforms such as Chef, Puppet, Ansible. Uh, we have support for cloud providers. There's many ways that you can deploy our one agent, all right? So most of you would already be aware of this, but it's super easy, super fast to get it up and running. So that means actually, because we are being able to deploy the one agent so quickly that it reduces the cost and the time it takes to get value out of our product. So that's the premise. It's easy to instrument and monitor your environment. Now, observability is not only a case of deploying our one agent, right? It is easy at scale, but it should also be easy to manage the configuration. And that is what this topic is about today. And then I want to set the, or paint a little picture that most of you might have already experienced yourself either with Dynatrace or maybe other uh, uh, platforms or, or applications that you had to handle. In a not so distant past, right? We were dealing not with uh, microservices, we were dealing with monolithic applications. And as an application owner, you had a certain set of requirements. You want to monitor your application. So you would go to the operations team and you'd say, hey, can you please monitor this application for me, create some dashboards, set up some alerting, maybe some synthetic tests, then the operations person was sure, no problem, right? Bob would go in and, and would happily create all of that for you. Now, if we look at today, we are not talking about application owners necessarily. We're talking about microservices teams. There's not just one application or microservice. There's many of them, hundreds or thousands at least of microservices, each with their own teams. And if you use the same methodology where you need to have all this configured for all of your microservices with dedicated dashboards, synthetic test notifications, all of that, and it needs to happen fast, a traditional approach would make this person, Bob, 
go crazy, right? And throw his coffee uh, away uh, at somebody's face. So we actually need to go and look at some self-service practice when it comes to observability. So operations teams, they need to employ a GitOps approach to observability with a solution that supports massive scale. The solution that supports massive scale you already have, right? You're using the Dynatrace platform. Now I'm going to talk today about how we can actually use a GitOps approach to observability. And you don't have to take our word for it, right? We, we looked at the, the 2020 state of DevOps report and we saw in there that actually the most highly evolved firms offer some sort of self-service when it comes to monitoring and alerting to their own teams. And of course, that is what we want to do. We want to limit toil and toil in the, in the state of DevOps report uh, is, is actually described as manual labor that is required to operationalize um, an application that could be easily automated. We want to limit toil, of course, because anything that's done manually is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And GitOps is the perfect practice that allows us to implement this, right? If you look at the de definition that, that CloudBees gives us uh, on GitOps, we can actually extract a, very, a few very important pieces. It's, it's a paradigm that allows or that empowers uh, developers to describe the state of their application in a set of codes. And what is uh, also part of that, right? We can actually look at, at monitoring as being part of that. So when you deploy your app, you have everything that is needed to run that app, to test that app, to deploy that app, to operationalize that app contained in the source repository. And what we want to do is we want to bring that idea, that paradigm of GitOps together with Dynatrace. And that actually came uh, or birthed the monitoring as code tool set that we we're going to be talking about today. So we at Dynatrace, we are also just a company, right? We are not so different than you and I, yeah? We, uh, we have the same needs. We have a massive amount of Dynatrace environments because we use Dynatrace to monitor Dynatrace, right? We also need to configure them because we need to make sure that we call them our self-monitoring environments are consistently configured and we don't have one or two, we have tens or not hundreds of these environments. So that meant that we needed a tool set that would support that. And we started using that tool set internally to manage these environments. And later on, uh, a few weeks ago, we decided to open source this for our customers because you also have the same requirements. You want to define an easy way to apply configuration to your Dynatrace environment or environments in a consistent and predictable way. And that came about as Dynatrace, as monitoring as code. We also refer to it as Project Monaco because face it, monitoring as code is not a very uh, attractive name, but Monaco definitely is, right? And so we came about with this tool set and we said, okay, it needs to have a certain set of features. And these are the features that we built in. So it allows us to apply GitOps. So configuration as code, which can be version controlled and by extension gives us features such as pull requests, approval workflows, and all the benefits and all the goodies that comes with it. It means that we can have zero touch configuration. Ideal in an ideal world, there's no manual manipulations that are being done in terms of configuration to, to a system, right? You want to store it in a repository, test it in an early environment, and when you're happy, you promote it automatically to a downstream environment. That is something that you can achieve using Monaco. We can implement an automated application onboarding workflow on a massive scale. I actually have a quote from a customer where we implemented this. Uh, this actually meant that they could reduce the time massively that it takes for them to onboard their thousands of applications into Dynatrace. We can apply a promotional flow to observability, right? Ties very closely into that zero touch configuration. We can synchronize configuration across environments, right? What if you have multiple environments that you need to keep in sync? We can download the configuration from an environment. So what if you already have an environment that has been configured for years and you want to actually store that configuration in a repository, that is also possible. And it allows you to create something we call technology fastbacks. Maybe this is for the Atmon users that are watching this, this, this webinar. They 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 recognize this term, something that we had a long time ago, like, hey, I have an MQ system 
uh, that I have, you know, used across my estate. Oh, there's somebody already who created a bunch of dashboards and, and custom services that I can just now apply uh, into my into my app mom or in this case Dynatrace environment. So this is actually what Monaco will allow us to do. And if you take that that little story that I had earlier with uh, with the massive amount of microservices teams, let's take a look at how this self service uh, model could look like in reality. So let's say that I am an SRE, site reliability engineer, and I need a dashboard to visualize my service level objectives for my project, right? What you can do then is you can define your dashboard in a file, right? The name of the dashboard, the time frame that you want to look at, maybe some filters that you have some management zone you want to filter by. You store that definition alongside your uh, application code, right? In a true GitOps way. Then you run Monaco through a pipeline or you run it manually from the command line, however you want to do it, right? Um, that is uh, up to you. And then Monaco will actually take care of configuring Dynatrace. In no, no point in time, me as an SRE needs to go into Dynatrace and manually create any of these configurations. Yes, Andy. I didn't want to interrupt your flow because it's just fantastic the way you explained why, you know, what it does and, and, and how it follows the GitOps approach. But there's a question that just came in and I think it, it fits now to have this answered, even though I think it's kind of included in this slide deck a little bit. The question is monitoring as code, who will take the lead here? Is it the DevOps team? Is it the monitoring team? Who is taking the lead of either integrating this into the pipeline or well, what have you seen so far? Yeah, so in, in general, and I, I always like to think about how we do things in Dynatrace, we have a team that actually supports the other teams to do their work. So they provide a platform for this. I see this as the same way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you would have teams that would set up all the infrastructure to make this happen. And then say, if you want to have a dashboard created, you can create your own dashboard and put it in your file. So if, if I'm a, a, maybe a DevOps team, say, hey, I have these custom services that I need to create or things like that. I, I store that definition into my repository and as the pipeline runs, it gets applied, but you are responsible for your own artifacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's the way that I see it. Yeah, perfectly put. I think in the end, what we need to figure out is how can we integrate this into the existing automation workflows, whether I think you will show Jenkins later, whether this is Jenkins that people mm -hmm. are using for deployment or delivery or other yeah. automation tools. So I guess the people that are responsible yeah. for monitoring should have a vested interest mm -hmm. in getting this integrated into the automation that then enables developers, SREs, whoever, with automated monitoring configuration. And I think that's the, uh, that's the great thing here about how this works. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. You should almost see it when you deploy your microservice, let's say, you know, you, do, you, do your, you build your artifact, you deploy it in an environment, you run some tests, right? You also to deploy your monitoring that is needed for this artifact to be properly monitored in, in, a, in an environment. It should just yeah. be part of it, right? It should not be a separate task that gets manually triggered. Exactly. Thanks. All right. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, let's look at the second use case, right? What if you have some sort of configuration, you want to centralize the storing of that configuration and, and the place where it gets applied into one or multiple Dynatrace environments? then you can define your entire structure, everything that you need or everything that you want to have configured inside, um, inside Dynatrace, you store it in a project in Monaco that you store inside a repository. Then you trigger Monaco and you say, hey, apply this configuration to X, Y, and Z tenants environments uh, and make sure that this uh, configuration is consistent across. And then uh, Monaco will just take this configuration and automatically deploy it. This is very handy if you're maybe an MSP, for example, right? where, you, uh, where you actually offer Dynatrace as a service to your internal customers. Um, you can easily uh, keep it up to date and keep it synchronized. Mm. Or even if you have, let's say, multiple UAT environments, different development environments, yeah. and they just want to standardize. I mean, this is, yeah. this is really cool. Yeah, so, so let's say, you know, if you have multiple, multiple environments, the, the chances are that you have certain things that always come back certain tagging rules that always need to be applied, certain dashboards that you always want to have. It doesn't make sense to do this manually, right? Yeah. You do it once, 
and then you configure it automatically on, on the other environments. Yeah. If you think about the, we just mentioned taking rules, we've been, for the performance engineers that I'm very close to, right? Um, we always teach about which taking rules, which request attributes uh, you should configure to extract um, the test information. I think this can be fully automated now using this approach. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But let's let's not look at the like what we have to say about it. Let's let's uh, hear from one of our customers. And and today we also launched, not by surprise, of course, also a blog post on this. Uh, good timing, you would say. And and this customer, uh, which is also referenced in the blog, uh, basically said the following: They were using by using Monaco, they were able to reduce the application onboarding time into Dynatrace from hours to a few minutes. Now this, this particular customer had hundreds, if not thousands of applications. So think about the amount of time, uh, energy and resources that were spent and also how quickly they could use Dynatrace because they didn't have to wait. There was no waiting period. It would just be done automatically through, through a self-service model. It's uh, pretty awesome to do. So what I would like to talk for a few minutes about is what actually Monaco can do and on a high level, how it works, right? Um, because it's also, of course, uh, an important piece. So when you look at the functionality, in, in, in the simplest of terms, you can look at uh, Monaco is able to deploy JSON uh, monitoring configurations to the Dynatrace API. So you may or you may not know that Dynatrace's API speaks JSON. Everything is represented in, in JSON objects. So we can use Monaco for that. Uh, it allows for us to template configuration. So if you have the same configuration, maybe an application definition or a dashboard or a management zone that in, uh, in say is very similar uh, in, in buildup, right? Maybe the name or the tag that is looking for is slightly different. You can just create one object, reuse it multiple times, uh, just with different values, different variables that are being, being filled in. Uh, we have an easy way to handle dependencies between configurations, right? Certain, for example, a management zone that is used in a dashboard, right? Uh, uh, instead of looking up the, the ID of the management zone configuration, we can actually reference it by name and Monaco will handle that. We can, as I mentioned already, deploy the same config several uh, to several environments in one call or do very specific uh, applications of config as well. So it's, it's very uh, uh, flexible in that regards. Uh, of course, it supports the standard create, update, and delete of, uh, of configurations. And you can organize yourself in, in, in multiple projects. You can create sub-projects. We support multiple environments. So like I said, it's, it was built for us for our scale. And we have that scale within Dynatrace. So we, uh, we also support that for, for our customers. And also very important is the item potency in configuration. So you can apply the same configuration over and over and over again, even over an existing configuration, and it will not give you any crazy results. It will just be what you expect. So the application only gets created once, right? It doesn't create multiple applications with different IDs, for example. And uh, Christoph, maybe to this one, because it just came in, but I think you already explained it pretty well. Uh, and especially the item potency uh, bullet point that he had here that means Monaco is smart enough to say I'm not recreating an element that has mm -hmm. already been configured on that Dynatrace environment based on the name. I guess the name is the unique identifier yes. because yeah. most of the configurations in Dynatrace have a unique name and that's why it's first pulling it and then yeah perfect. Yeah. Cool. And as a new feature actually uh, to be released, I will show it already to you today, but it will be officially released uh, later this week. Uh, we also have that ability to download an existing configuration uh, of, uh, of an existing environment as well. So Monaco itself, it's an executable uh, that is released for Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, and to call it, it supplies, it suffices to just tell it where your projects are stored. Um, and you can optionally also specify which project you want to apply. So let's say you have, you know, you create a project per application and you have a thousand applications. These are the scales that we're dealing with with our customers. You might not want to apply all projects in one go because that will take a long time to iterate through all of these calls. You want to make it fast. You want to make it specific. You can also specify which particular projects you want to apply. 
you specify uh, in a YAML file um, all your environments uh, that you want to apply. So you can define all your environments. I will talk about it in a little bit. And also here you can say, well, do you want to apply it to all or specific environments? And that's also an optional parameter. So as an example here, right? I have Monaco. Um, I have an environments file that I reference. I want to apply a particular project called ACE and all my projects are stored in the Mac slash projects folder. If you execute Monaco without any parameters, it gives you the help. This is actually, it. that's what happens in IT, right? So you, you create a screenshot, you blink, and then the screenshot's outdated. One of these cases, because in the new version that was released, uh, actually this, uh, this help was, uh, was slightly amended and it was more, even more information that was added. So definitely a good thing. So in short, and I think I already alluded to that a little bit, Monaco needs five things. The first is one or more projects folder. So here I have two projects, one called ACE, one called infrastructure, where I store all my configuration in. These are free form, you can name them whatever you want. Uh, they, cannot be, they cannot have the name of a particular configuration though, but other than that, they are free form and you can create sub projects. Then within each project, you need to create uh, folders uh, that have the correct name that actually designate which type of config it is. So a dashboard to create a dashboard, management zone to create a management zone. And that is very important because it's based on that name that Monaco will figure out to which endpoint it needs to send uh, this object. And then within each config, you need one or more JSON files. And the JSON files actually represent the templates that I was talking about, the objects that are going to be sent to the Dynatrace API. And then alongside of that, you have one or more YAML files uh, that represent the instances that you want to create. So which instances of this template do I want to create? And last but not least, like I mentioned, uh, uh, another YAML file that describes the environment. So basically this structure is, is what needed uh, to, uh, for Monaco to do, its, to do its job. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail into all of these configurations, um, but, but to, to kind of give you a high level overview of what is possible, um, in the environments file, you, this configuration file that, that lists all the environments, you re reference them by name. So you give each of your environments a name. And if you want to apply a specific environment when you run uh, a Monaco, that's the name that you also reference. Yeah. Uh, it supports both uh, SAS and managed environments, of course. Um, that is important. And you can just uh, provide an environment variable name that contains the API token. So do not, do not store the API token directly in this file for security reasons, of course, but you say this is the name of the environment variable that contains the token. That also makes it very easy to integrate with things like Jenkins uh, or other platforms that have some good security uh, uh, storage uh, possibilities. And you can also group your environments together uh, so you can actually divide your dev staging and production environments like that. Uh, and then you can say, well, I want to apply, in this case, the customer environment. Uh, and then certain configurations later on can be specified. So that an application definition in dev will be different than it is in staging and production. You can be very specific when you configure, uh, when you configure that. Uh, Optionally as well, you can also store the environment URL and actually any other data point um, in uh, an environment variable, but more on that uh, more on that later. So like I said, uh, when you create these uh, folders that contain the configuration, they need to have a particular name. And I put a link here at the bottom uh, that li links us to the, um, to the Git page that contains this information, but based on that folder, uh, a particular API endpoint will be targeted. Uh, so this is very important. Uh, Andy, you and I, we had a chat about this mm -hmm. where you were uh, uh, just putting it in, in random folder names and it wouldn't work. Well, uh, that's, that's, that's the reason why. So these folders are very, very specific. Well, you can say it as it was. I was complaining it doesn't work. And then, then you said, well, <laughs> you got the no. naming wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true, that's true, yeah. Uh, I'd like to have a beer with you at some point again. So uh, like I'm, I'm being nice. Uh, so uh, we also have JSON templates, the object that needs to be, or that will, that represented, that will be sent to the API 
Now, it supports variables for your reusability. So instead of, um, instead of mentioning the environment name or the tag value in this case, or the name, uh, I can actually just create a variable, a variable out of it. And if I want to reuse it, then I don't have to uh, uh, manage and maintain separate JSON files for each. I can just reuse it, then create multiple instances of it. Mm -hmm. So you also notice that there is no config IDs uh, or references to other config IDs. They should be omitted uh, from, from, from this file. We will handle that in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so in our YAML files, we, like I said, define the instances. Yeah, so each configuration always contains a, man, uh, a name like management zone staging, and then which uh, templates, so JSON file it should use. And then for each of these instances, we actually can fill in those variables. That's what I explained earlier, right? So you can see here that my, my uh, name uh, variable I fill in, and that's the name in the end that the object will have inside Dynatrix. And I can use environment variables. So any environment variable that is exposed in the system that is running in, I can just use that to fill this in. This makes it very powerful in combination with, with pipelines where you have variables that, that can be passed along. Uh, not really shown in this slide, but just so you know, here you can also apply certain configs differently depending on the, on the, on the environment that you're looking at. Yeah, so if you have dev staging prod, so you can say, well, my management zone in dev needs to be different than in prod uh, without having to create multiple instances of it. It's just different values, values that mm -hmm. get filled in. Mm -hmm. So you can also uh, reference other configurations. So a typical case uh, that, that's, that most people get in touch with or get, need to handle is, is uh, where you have an application detection rule that always is linked to a particular application. Yeah, so normally you would first uh, uh, create the application, right? Uh, get the ID of the configuration object and then use that to create your application detection rule. So meaning you need two separate calls, which even need some sort of handling of the response of the first one to use it in the second. That's of course very cumbersome and not something you want to do. Um, so uh, what we will do is uh, using Monaco, we don't even need to know the entity ID. The entity ID is something that will be taken care of for us. So see here my application detection rule JSON file, and you can see that I've uh, created a variable for my application identifier. Yeah. In my YAML file for that application detection rule, instead of uh, uh, putting in there uh, uh, the actual identifier, you can see that I'm referencing um, another Monaco object. Yeah, so I have my ACE project, yeah. Uh, in there, I have an application as my application definition. Maybe I'll highlight it here with my, with my mouse, if that works. Um, so you can actually test the configuration type. And then in there, I have a configuration called app-simple-node-staging. Mm -hmm. And from that object, I take the ID. And then Monaco will figure it out. Monaco will figure out what the ID is, and then we'll fill it in automatically. So I, that's what I mentioned here, right? I have an application definition called app-simple-node staging, and there I just get the ID. All right, so it makes it very easy to work with the configuration because then you no longer care about IDs, uh, which is the trickiest part of uh, unique identifiers, right? Mm -hmm. um, is keeping track of them. So that is in, I would say 20 minutes maybe, a, a quick introduction uh, into what Monaco, uh, what Monaco can do and what it is and where we came from. So we as an organization, like I said, similar needs, we needed something that scales and this is what we created. Um, so what I would like to do next over the maybe five, 10 minutes is actually show you uh, in real life uh, what we have. Uh, but maybe Andy, this is also a good time for some questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so there's a couple of questions I try to answer some of them already. Uh, one was focusing around the use case of creating dashboards and sharing them with users. So is it the question was, well, is it possible to create a dashboard with Monaco and yes, then having sure. this dashboard share with users, right? Uh, one additional question that then came to my mind, if, Mon if Monaco creates an asset like a dashboard, does Monaco spit out the um, resources it created? Like to say that dashboard ID, um, or even the link to a dashboard, because I think dashboard is a very specific scenario where mm -hmm. you want to then maybe also know the URL and then reuse this 
for maybe mm -hmm. the next step in your pipeline, maybe sending out a tweet or not a tweet, but maybe a Slack to say, hey. Yeah. Just <laughs> um, yes, well, Twitter, of course, uh, uh, that's maybe a bit far-fetched, but when you when you apply it using the command line, when you create an object, it actually gives you the unique identifier of that object. Um, that being said, right, and we will talk about the open sourceness of, uh, of Monaco. Uh, if, if things like that are important, it is very easy to extend upon uh, upon the Monaco code base as well. So uh, uh, if extras are needed, then, then that's something you can look at. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. cool. I, will, uh, I, right, will queue, I will queue some of the questions for later because I think uh, your demo will run also for a while and maybe as more as your demo yeah. is running, then I will. Yeah, for sure, questions. for sure. So, so so let me let me start with my first example. Um, and, and that's actually the case where, let's say you already have an environment. I think most of the people that are here are not starting with Dynatrace. They already have Dynatrace in place, right? So I have a similar, uh, a similar use case for that. I have here our demo.life environment. This is the, the environment that, that, our, that our sales engineers, our services people, even our sales people uh, use to actually show what Dynatrace can do. Uh, this is an environment that has a lot of configuration. You can see here, uh, you know, Quite a number of applications are here. Lots of dashboards that are that are set up. So what I will do is I will actually download that configuration. So I have here uh, my good old trusted uh, command line, and and in this folder, not so you guys kind of know what is happening. Uh, I have two things. I have the executable, right, the Monaco executable, and I have a file called environments.yaml. So. If I just show you what's inside this file, you'll see, and of course that's zooming in actually makes it a little bit tricky, but you'll see here that I named this environment ACE um, as in the autonomous cloud enablement team. Uh, and um, I have here two environment variables that I'm referencing. I have here my DT underscore tenant URL that I have. It's a name and environment variable and the API token. These are all stored in uh, environment variables that I did right before uh, this call. I will not show them to you because otherwise I will you know, probably make some people angry. Um, but what I can do now is I can actually call, call Monaco. I'm going to cheat again uh, because I've created the configuration of the, or the command so I don't have to type it because typing on a WebEx is probably the worst thing. Um, so I have here my commands. So I just call Monaco with the download flag and I specify which file I want to use. It's very simple. It's you know command with two arguments or three arguments or two arguments. And as I am doing that, it is actually iterating through it. Yeah, so some it, uh, things are not downloaded because there doesn't exist. Yeah, but we have here uh, management zones are being downloaded, uh, notification settings are being downloaded. So we actually have here a bunch of configurations that are being downloaded, and at the same time. Time, right? This is actually that folder, but in Visual Studio Code. And you can actually see Monaco created a folder called ACE. Why ACE? Because that's the name of my environment. And in here, as it's actually going live, um, and it will fill out as we as we are going across. But you can see here, my management zones are all being downloaded. Yeah. So I have here my uh, uh, definitions. Yeah, so my particular management zones that are created. And I now also have a YAML file that contains all of them. Yeah, so these are the configurations that are needed. And these are just all stored. Yeah, so this is something now that I can put this in a repository. And excuse me, then I will be starting the, the, the possibility to version control this. Yeah, so this will run for a while. And when I say a while, I really mean a while um, because this, like I said, this environment has a lot of configuration in it. Now it's downloading dashboards, but there are a lot of dashboards in here, a couple of thousands uh, maybe. So this is actually also a good point. Like you often don't know what is configured until you actually take a proper look at it, right? So this is actually what this allows you to do as well. Great dashboards name, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, right? So you can see here that we, we actually have all of these um, are being downloaded as we speak. So that is actually a very handy use case because now I've got a backup of my configuration that I can start storing in a repository. And it's a great place to get started with Monaco because you don't want to start from scratch. You want to start with what you already have. Um, 
And that is this. Okay. It's really cool. amazing. Yes. So this is this is actually the first step. I want to download my uh, my configuration, but that is not all that we want to do, all right? So as you can see, this is still running in the in the background. Um, maybe by the time that our webinar is over, this will this will be done just for the sheer amount of configuration that we have. Now, what if I've got a new environment? Yeah. What if I have a new environment and I want to I want to start setting this up? Or what if I want to apply a certain configuration in an automated way using Monaco to an environment? So here I have actually uh, my own demo environment that I actually use for demos, obviously. I cleaned it up right before this, um, this session uh, because I always configure it using Monaco anyway, right? So there's no manual configuration here. So it's, it's completely empty. Automated tags are all gone. I don't have any management zones. Nothing is here. Yeah, no applications are defined. Uh, I hope I at this least, yeah, I created, I deleted everything. So what I will do next is, and in this repository, and uh, this is a Gitty, right? So, uh, a lot of people ask me, what is this Gitty or Gitty or however you pronounce it? What is this? It's like a, a, a local Git server. Uh, so to remove all the dependencies on, on anything external, I'm running just, just on um, something I call the Ace Box, which is a virtual machine that I'm running. Uh, and in here, you'll see that, that I've got here a Mac folder. And in the Mac folder, uh, I've defined my environments. This is separate from what I showed you earlier. This is not on, this is inside a virtual machine. So and in my project folder, I've got here a project called ACE. And I've got a project called infrastructure. The infrastructure name is perhaps not the best, but you should look at this global config. Config that is applicable for anything inside my, my, my environment, things like um, Kubernetes credentials. If I want to monitor my Kubernetes cluster, that is not for just one app, that's for all apps, right? Maybe I have some tagging rules that are, you know, uh, global that needs to be applicable for all my apps, certain request attributes, or even synthetic locations uh, to set up a private location. So that's what I have here. And in my ACE project, I see it as an application project. This is for one particular team, one application, even some customers uh, uh, arrange it or manage it on a microservices level of granularity, but that's entirely up to you. In here, I have a couple of management zones. Uh, I have some dashboards, some calculated service metrics, and also some tagging rules and application definition. So if I take one of these, one of these out, let's say a, a synthetic monitor here, I can actually see that I have my very simple JSON object, right? It's very simple because, well, this is just doing a very simple get request to a particular endpoint. That's all it's doing. But you could also do this with complicated uh, uh, web scripts. So this is the object, right? And then here I'm going to create, and that's maybe a good place where I can highlight that. I'm going to create multiple instances of this because I've got this app that I'm running. I've got it running in staging and I've got it running in production, but I'm actually monitoring it with the same Dynatrace environment. So my health check in staging, you can see here, I give it a particular name, right? I'm going to mac.simplenode.staging. I'm not really good with names, but it should do, I guess. Um, and I'm going to point it towards a particular URL, uh, giving a description. And you can see here, there's a couple of places where there's location, management zone ID, um, tag, an app ID, all of these are references to other pieces, yeah? And instead of hard coding in here the location or the management zone, I'm actually referring to even a different project because this is not in my ACE project, this is in the infrastructure project. So I can actually go and request configurations from a different project, which is my synthetic location that I named ACEbox, yeah? And it will actually go through that project request it from the Dynatrace API and give me that identifier and put it in there. And then we have our application ID. Uh, that's yeah, a typical example that I want to link to this, to this uh, synthetic test. And I'm reusing the same test because the test is the same. It's just certain variables are different. Uh, so here my URL is not simple node.staging, but now it's simple node.production, right? Um, so very, it makes it very easy to handle this. All right, so that's actually then where I store all of my configuration. 
Yeah. Now the next thing that I will do is I will actually trigger this through a Jenkins pipeline. So I've got here my good old faithful uh, Jenkins, right? Uh, and I've got a, a pipeline. Uh, I need to make sure I go to the right folder here, right? So I've, I've created a pipe fi pipeline file that I call uh, mac.jenkins file. And you can see here, you know, the formatting is a little bit, yeah, skewed, but you can see here that that's I'm referencing my environments file. And one of the cool things that Monaco can do as well is you can do a dry run. And the dry run will just validate all of your config. Does it, does it make sense? Did you not make a typo? Because everybody makes, makes typos, right? Uh, does the structure of your configuration, is it sound? Um, and I divide it over. First, I apply my infrastructure project. And then if it's happy, right, then I will apply it. So first a validate or a dry run, and then I will deploy it. Yeah. Hmm. Once that's done, right, I actually do the same thing, but for my ACE project. Yeah, so I separated it out. Um, so let's take a look at what this does. So if I have here my pipeline, and this is probably a good time again to, uh, to answer some questions, this will take, like you see, about two minutes, mm -hmm. right? We can, uh, we can go and take a look. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, there's actually a couple of questions. Uh, again, I'll try to answer most of them already in the Q&A feature. Uh, one of the question was around secret management. So mm -hmm. actually, I initially understood the question wrong. So I will. I thought the question was around how can you get secrets into Monaco? How do you get it mm -hmm. out of your secrets manager of your vault mm -hmm. or something like this? And obviously, you would do it just as you show now from, let's say, Jenkins or whatever tool you use for automation. You mm -hmm. would access the secrets that you can then pass to Monaco as environment variables, and then Monaco can apply. Yep. The the, the, the question though that was actually really uh, asked, uh, thanks for the clarification, was uh, can you also extract secrets from Dynatrace? So you showed the Kubernetes configuration. And I said, this would obviously be a security hole. This is why we are not allowing to access secrets that you've passed to Dynatrace, mm -hmm. either through the UI mm -hmm. and also not through the API. This is why you cannot extract this. And yeah, you know, secrets exactly. have a place in your secret managers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there, there are, and this is actually not something that Monaco does. This is just Dynatrace, right? This is, you know, our platform. We, we, we care about your security, right? So we, we, we are not able to access this data anyway. So neither is Monaco. Um, mm -hmm. That's for good reasons. But yeah. you can, let's say, download, let's talk about Kubernetes, download that configuration, right? Mm -hmm. And then supply the token again and reapply it. And it will just see, yeah, the configuration already exists. I will I will update it with the token that I got because it doesn't know if it's a new token or not or it's the mm -hmm. same. But uh, um, uh, uh, it will all be good mm -hmm. uh, and it will be updated in in, in Dynatrace. Uh, so it's good if you're rotating tokens, for example, you could use yeah. Monaco to automatically it's apply perfect. them. Um, yeah. yeah, that's an awesome use case. Yeah, good. Cool. Um, so what question or do you wanna you go yeah. on? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep the next questions to later. I'll first do my thing and then, and then yeah. yeah, we'll go to the question. So my pipeline finished, uh, great, uh, happy camper here. Uh, so now I can go and take a look. If I just refresh this uh, demo, always exciting, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I refreshed my screen and now I have two applications that are defined, yeah? Uh, I will have also a, two synthetic tests right, that are defined. And if I go into my settings, I will have all the things that I need to run my demos. I have my automated tags, right? Um, I have my, uh, no, not accounting, that's not what I need, but I do want to see my management zones. Yeah, I have my management zones. I have my calculated service metrics. All of them are now created um, automatically. So for me, and this is of course my use case, but if I ever, my tenant blows up, Mm -hmm. right for some reason right i can just get a new tenant new dynatrace environment and i can just pretend like nothing ever happened i just apply the configuration and i can continue uh without breaking a sweat yeah and so that's also one of the one of the use cases like okay how do i back this up and how do i uh, uh make sure that that i can just apply this to any new environment so we have, have customers that say i have SaaS environments i want to go to manage how do I deal with this? Well, you can use Monaco for this because the IDs are, are stripped out anyway. So 
we can we can take this configuration and apply it to the new environment um, from SaaS to managed or vice versa. Very cool. Yes. And then that's actually my demo piece. Uh, okay. Let me then let me just uh, get in a couple of questions in uh, before. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think they just fit. Uh, one question that came in from Johannes, uh, how do I delete configuration? You mentioned in the slides in the beginning, you can also delete configuration. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Uh, so the delete functionality, I need to get back to my slides here, uh, my, my browser here, um, is, is actually, you can define it into a file. So if I have here my Mac projects folder, you'll see that there is a delete.yaml. So I can in here specify, the configurations that I want to delete. Now, full transparency, the delete functionality is something that will be revisioned or revised. Uh, we, need to, we need to take a closer look at this um, uh, and, and we will probably refactor this and change the behavior and change the way that it works in the future, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. right. um, very cool. Uh, uh, I mean, for me, what comes to mind is right when you run a, a, a like an update or a create that you keep kind of track of what has been created. Mm -hmm. And then if you run again and then you remove some config file, then maybe have Mona give Monaco the option to say, this is the new configuration. Here's the stuff that was mm -hmm. created in the past. And then with the option, delete stuff that is no longer relevant. Maybe mm -hmm. just get rid of it. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question was an observation actually when you did the extraction earlier like the download and you showed us some of the uh, JSON files it seemed that mm -hmm. some of the IDs were actually mm -hmm. still in there but you yep. mentioned that IDs are actually something yeah. that we don't that we deal with through the name so what does this mean that's that's a very good question uh, and that is indeed so the download functionality like I said is is uh, in its early early days we just implemented this so I think what I showed was, don't really know. I think some management zone or something. Management yeah. zone. Yeah. Yeah. There, no, no, of course. It's whenever you want something that's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. There we go. Cool. So that's that's a very good question. So here you see host group identifiers. So um, we are, uh, so with the first version, it strips out the, uh, the original name. You can see that becomes uh, a variable mm -hmm. automatically. Now we are working on how can we replace automatically all the variables wherever it, it works with, 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 uh, with identifiers, but that is not something that is implemented. But when you create configuration, right, mm -hmm. that is completely, uh, completely stripped out. So if I, if I take, let's say, whichever, my auto tag.json, mm -hmm. right? Well, this is maybe not the best example, but you see anything that's that can be variables, yeah. right? We we can supply that, and if we need to look at look up something, we can also do that, and that's what I showed you when I did my synthetic test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my synthetic monitor, yeah, has here a bunch of variables: you know, name, of course, description, yes, of course, but also my location is no longer an ID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my management zone is no longer an ID, yeah. and the application is also no longer an ID. Yeah. So good. So that means you keep working. I mean, obviously the example you showed earlier with the host groups, mm -hmm. uh, ho ho I mean, host group makes sense. That's that's something you can reference by name. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess with the, the, the next, let's say evaluation or the next mm -hmm. version of that uh, export feature, you will also mm -hmm. replace those IDs with names. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. That's something that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Cool. Then the next, uh, it's actually not really a question. It's just a confirmation. Uh, can we use this to back up the entire environment? Well, that is actually what I'm probably still running what you're here doing in here, the background, right? still downloading the dashboards. It looks yeah. like it's stuck, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know I this is the, our demo environment with, with thousands of dashboards and thousands of, like this is the environment we've been running for so many years. Yeah, and exactly. A lot of people have done a lot of things. Exactly. Yeah. If I go into this dashboard folder, it's already has gotten really, really big, but it's it's yeah. not finished yet. It's constantly still, you can see it refreshing and new things are, are being added. So uh, yeah. yes, you can use this. Yeah, and I think obviously the extraction is, is one great use case to get started. If you have something configured and you want to then replicate it, but I think the ultimate goal of us in our industry is to start the other way around because every time you push something right. through your pipeline, right, your code, you deploy mm -hmm. it. And then you, besides deploying that code, you mm -hmm. also de deploy the config monitoring configuration. So it should always yeah. 
think in the future we want to go that direction. Uh, next question, uh, does this also work for creating SLOs? So in Dynatrace, we introduced a new feature recently, mm -hmm. uh, service level objectives. And the question is, can this also be used to automate SLO creation? It's a very good question. Um, so what we reuse is the Dynatrace API. We've just recently released the API endpoints for, for SLOs. So it actually, and I think there is a GitHub issue for that um, to create support within Monaco for, for the SLO feature. It's currently not built, but that is something that will, um, that will, that will arrive at some point when, when uh, the open source community, um, somebody decides to, to implement it. Hmm. Which is another next question. How much does this cost? I think what's the call, what's the licensing of Monaco? Mm -hmm. And I think you just said it, it's an open source project. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe I should revise that statement. Uh, I, I, I take uh, a beers. Uh, that's, that's how you can, <laughs> okay. how you can pay. I think anybody in Dynatrace can be, but no, um, this is indeed an open source initiative. Maybe it's a good time also to, um, to bring up that part. Uh, so yeah. if you go to, uh, because I am not so good with, uh, with URLs. Actually, you can see here on mon mon monitoring as code here uh, is on the open source on GitHub. You can download the latest release to see new version was released five days ago uh, and uh, everything comes with it, right? So we have GitHub issues, of course, mm -hmm. um, that, um, that you can track. Uh, and, and I think there is already an SLO, um, here we go, support for SLO API. So it's the, the community is all over it, um, but, that being said, uh, if you have a certain feature that you would like to see and, and you are not uh, uh, too unhandy with Go development, because yeah, Monaco is written in Go, uh, mm -hmm. feel free to pick up one of these, these tickets and, and, and start uh, uh, working away. The community will be very grateful. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And by the way, everyone that is still online, I just posted the link to that GitHub repository in the chat of uh, Zoom. So you, you should be able to see that. Perfect. Uh, very cool. Hey, Andy, before we, we still take some last questions, uh, I want to make sure that, that uh, there are some other things that I would like to, would like to highlight uh, yep. as part of this uh, performance mm -hmm. clinic. Yep. So, um, so first of all, how do you get started? I think that's very important. Like where, where to next? Because this is cool, but now what? Um, so as, as I just showed you, GitHub is, on, is, on, uh, is containing our Monaco uh, source code and also the, uh, the releases. So go to the GitHub uh, repo check out the readme, download the executable uh, and, and start to get going. If you have a new environment or an existing environment, uh, download your configuration like I showed you and start version controlling it, right? You, you saw it was literally uh, one command and things start running. If you have a new environment or, or even after you've downloading it, downloaded your existing configuration, let's, uh, let's start putting this in a Git repository. Let's start anything new that is created, every new application, every new tagging rule, instead of doing it manually, do it the proper way. Yeah? Use GitOps from, from the beginning. Perform is coming. Perform always comes with uh, hands-on training sessions. Uh, we have a dedicated Monaco hands-on training session uh, uh, delivered by, by yours truly. Uh, so um, yeah, sign up for that uh, if you want to know a little bit more. Uh, and as I already said as well, take part in the open source movement that is Monaco. Mm -hmm. right? Create some issues, uh, code, contribute. There's many ways to contribute. You don't have to be a developer. Um, having great ideas is the best contribution that you can probably make. Uh, and for those who are already using Captain for progressive delivery, uh, there's also a Monaco service created uh, for Captain. Uh, so you can actually have Captain trigger Monaco uh, and apply your configuration as well. So if you want to know more, right, there is also a great blog post by my colleague Radek uh, on Dynatrace Managed as a service. Uh, I suggest you read it if you are a managed customer. Uh, the link here to GitHub for Monaco is there as well. Uh, today, a blog post went live. Um, yeah, <laughs> literally an hour or so <laughs> before our performance clinic. Uh, on the topic as well uh, about our story and what we're just, uh, aiming to, to do. And uh, there's a link also to the Captain Monaco service as well. And then do not forget, like I said, perform is coming. 
Uh, you can go to, uh, to, uh, to the link that I also put here in the slide at the bottom, the bit.ly link it will bring you to the Dantris University uh, where you can sign up for, and there are so many great hands-on training sessions, right? Um, if it's not monitoring as code that, uh, that tickles your fancy, there are many other topics around, around quality gates, around SLOs, um, around dashboarding, around managed, uh, all the topics Dynatrace you can imagine will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, sign up for them. All right, it's really great content. And of course it's, it's remote now. So uh, um, that makes it uh, super uh, accessible for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And kind of last piece of uh, advertisement <laughs> Now for myself and for my team. So as Andy mentioned in the beginning, I'm part of the uh, autonomous cloud enablement services team. As a practice manager, I work with a lot of customers. So some of you might already know me, but we are actually doing this day in, day out. So we help our customers tackle really those uh, difficult problems that are not necessarily technology, but that are often, often around processes and people. All right, so monitoring as a service or monitoring as code, what we have seen just now, right? That's something that we handle. Uh, but then also topics like quality gates, incident management, and then automated problem remediation. If, if you want to know more, if you'd like to engage with us, um, there's an email address at the bottom. My name is on this slide, so you can find me via Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm sure that people will find a way. Um, so um, yeah, please, please let us know. So on that, uh, Andy, uh, I wanted to thank you as well for, for the slot that I could talk here about, about a topic that is, that is dear to me. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe time for one or two more questions. I know that we've used our hour to the fullest. Um, yeah, but, well, yeah. thanks thanks for uh, thanks for enlightening us about this and showing us this. I know there's, there's, I mean, obviously you and I are the face for this, but as a big team behind the scenes, like the, yes. the our, our internal our Dynatrace colleagues that are working in the ACE team that have initially created this. So we also want to thank all of those because thanks Definitely. to them, we now have something that we can bring mm. to our customers. Um, if I can add one one thing, and yeah. because people often ask me, well, this is open source. Uh, I mean, can I can I really count on it? Well, you have to look at it like this. We internally depend on it. Right? So it, yeah. if it doesn't work, right, we are in trouble ourselves. So we we do work on this. We we maintain it. We update it. We look for new features to add. Um, so this is something that's really important to us. And like you've mentioned, Andy, the great team behind this, because I am not the great team behind this. I'm also, I'm a contributor, uh, but I'm not uh, the driving source, the uh, driving force. Um, those people take this very seriously and, 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 uh, and did an obvious, obviously great job uh, by creating uh, Monaco. Don't be too humble on your position in that whole thing because you've, <laughs> you've, you've, you bring this to our customers. You wrote the captain extension. I'm very grateful for that because I'm using this now every day. <laughs> um, I, other than that, I, I think we've answered all the questions that came in. There's just a lot of positive, great feedback. Uh, another one just says, thank you, very exciting. We've asked Dynatrace One for such a solution to help us move configuration between environments. And uh, because they want to offer Dynatrace internally as a service, fantastic work. So I think this just there's a lot of people that are very happy about this capability. We're That's also, it, yeah. yeah, we're also, you should also, you know, we should shout this out internally to the Slack channel that we have for that team. It's really, really good stuff. Yeah. Um, Christoph, I'm pretty sure this topic, as you said, it's ongoing. There will be improvements. Um, and we will have you back on this or any other topic. At any, I mean, at any time. But there's so, so much great stuff that comes out of. Yeah, you know, we'll, looking forward to it, Andy. Uh, happy to uh, happy to be a part of it. And with that, I want to say thank you so much for the attendees. You can see here a couple of additional links, but I guess by now you know them anyway. And um, I would say hopefully we'll see some of you virtually at Perform. There's still time to register, whether for the main conference or for the hands-on training days would be awesome to see you there. And uh, with that, I say tschüss and baba. Thank you, Ali. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Christoph, I think as you are uh, officially the host, you need to stop it somehow or stop the okay. recording or stop it. So what do I do? End meeting? I think that's, that's it? what it is, yeah. I'll catch up with you later on Slack, okay? All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.